Hey guys, Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations. Welcome back to the shop. Today's presentation is going to be about a process called chasing threads. And funny story, the reason that chasing threads is, is near and dear to my heart was when I was a young man, I was working in a shop. It was a molding shop, so we had a bunch of injector nozzles and you know they're all pipe threads, right? Big pipe threads. Well, a guy brings an injector nozzle into the shop and he had dropped it while he was trying to put it back on the barrel dinged up the threads. Naturally, you're going to chase those threads to repair them. So he gives it to the guy I was working with and said, would you mind chasing these threads for me? Now this practical joker, Lenny was his name, he laid it down on the floor and he kicked it and he chased it. Okay, he ran. <laughs> and that's a true story, I swear to God. He kicked it and he chased it and because of the pitch of the thread, this injector nozzle went out around the workbench and came right back to where I was standing watching him do this. It made a complete lap and came right back and he picked it up and he hands it back to the guy and he says, okay, now what? That is God's honest truth. He couldn't have planned that any better if he, if he sat down and cat it out. Anyway, chasing threads. Before I really get into it and show you how I do it, how a lot of people do it, there's just one additional detail that I want to share with you that I haven't seen anybody really explain. And the best way to do that is with word association. If I can plant a picture in your head then you may just say, oh, hey, I get it, I get it. And the best way to do that is with a train. I've been thinking about how to explain this so that you understand what's going on. So imagine a train. There's my train right there behind me. You have an engine in the front or in the back. It really doesn't matter. So, But for this particular discussion, engine is in the back. Think about an engine lathe. The engine lathe is driven... From the left hand side, the belt comes up from the motor to some type of pulley cluster, gear cluster, goes through a billion other gears and shafts and keyways, and then the spindle starts to turn. Okay? If your lathe runs directly off of your motor, well, chances are you've got a very special machine because I've never seen one like that, but they may exist. Okay, the train. This train pulled in the night before, stopped. The guy puts the brakes on. Let's just assume there's no brakes on all these cars because they're old and busted. The engine stops. What happens to the train? It goes kaboom, 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 kaboom. All of these couplings reach the extent of their design characteristic. So the train gets longer. Okay? The train gets longer. In the morning he comes out, says, okay, time to go. Puts the train in gear. And that's when you hear... In the train yard, you hear the boom, 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 boom. All the couplings are hammering together as the train starts to pull away. Well, this is the same thing that happens inside of an engine lathe when you fire it up. It only happens really quick. You have all of these gears that are meshing because they're not exactly spot on where they would generate so much heat the machine would melt. And you have keyways. You have a bunch of different things that all have to be loaded up in a positive drive direction before the machine turns on at speed. Now if you shut it down, there's a moment where all of these little couplings relax and God only knows what's going on inside that machine because you've just shut it off and you shut it off from the drive end. Okay? You didn't shut it off from the nose. If you stopped it at the nose, chances are it would be better. But stopping it at the motor, motor stops first, clutch shuts it down, whatever, things loosen up. When you chase a thread, or even when you run a metric thread on an imperial machine, and you don't get to disengage the half nut, this could really come in to play. And when you chase a thread, nine times out of ten, it does come into play. So what's the process of chasing a thread? Get the machine all set up, get your parts squared away, running concentric, true, you got all your pitches dialed in. Now I am assuming with the topic of this video that you know how to run a thread, okay? So I'm not going to get into the basics of tool positioning and fish gauges and compound setups and all the things that are going to generate comments. Don't even bother, please. If you're, if you're not quite sure how to run the threads, there's a lot of other quality videos online, some even on my channel that may help you to get there and understand more about picking up an existing thread or the skills required to have confidence to attempt that. That's what this is all about. Okay, you got your machine, it's running, everything is good, parts in there, it's all true. You engage the half nut, 
with the half nut engaged, with the carriage moving, with everything dancing and singing, boom, shut it down. Do not disengage the half nut. What did you just do? You just stopped the train. So there's some coast. The machine's going to coast. The carriage is going to coast a little bit. Things are not going to be in the exact position that they will be when you are running that thread. Things have changed because of the deceleration, the drift, the coast, whatever you want to call it, things have changed. So this is part one of chasing the thread. The machine is stopped, it's in gear, everything is cool. This is only going to get you close. This is when you use your compound, your bright lights, your headsets, magnifiers, whatever, and you put that tool, you physically change the location of that tool with the half nut engaged, with the compound, whatever you need to do, get that tool lined up in the slot of the thread. Now, in doing this, the starting position of your threading tool has changed. So if you're running up against the stop, please realize that you may want to reevaluate where that stop is set. The timing of the gears, the timing of the carriage, the imperial thread should not change so you can disengage the half nut, move it back to a nice new starting position, and when you engage it, it should track relatively close to where you want it to. An operative word, relatively close, doesn't mean it's going to because of all of this going on, all that drift. So once you've got it lined up on the first operation, once you think you say, okay, I'm close, take your cross slide and back it out. Because if you engage it, I guarantee you're going to see things happen that you weren't planning on and you're not going to like. So I'm going to run a big heavy thread. It's going to be a left hand thread. It's going to be a very coarse pitch. And that is strictly so that I can get a camera down there and show you exactly what I'm talking about. I'm going to take the part out. I'm going to put the part back in. That's a nightmare. Taking a thread out of a machine before it's done, uh, don't do it. Now, second topic before we go out. Can you indicate a thread? No, not so much. You know, because the indicator is going to bounce off the high spots and jump all around and really, you know, I've never seen a good way to do it. If anybody out there has a good way other than what I'm going to suggest, by all means, post it in the comment line. I'd love to hear how you guys do it. If you have concentric diameters, known concentric diameters to the thread that you need to repair, well, then get them running true and just pray that the guy that made the part before you didn't use a nut as a gauge and did it the right way, made sure everything was true or turned at the same time, and you can trust it and do the chase procedure. The only way that I can tell you how to indicate a thread is to mic the OD of the thread if it's in good shape, make yourself a sleeve, slide it over the thread, indicate the sleeve. I don't see any other way to do it. I personally don't see any other way to do it. If you want to check a thread, if the thread is running concentric to the OD, a lot of people are worried about this, but I can tell you, you can have a perfect pitch diameter on a thread that is not cut concentric to the OD of the part that you're working on, and when it goes, you know, you try to assemble it, it doesn't work. Why? Because stack tolerances, stack dimensions being what they are, you are outside of the range of a good fit somewhere and it's going to lock up even if it's got a perfect pitch diameter, it's still not going to work. How do you check that? Use one wire, use two wires, but only use it on one side of the part. Put the wires in the root of the thread, OD thread, mic it, come up with your number, turn it apart 90 degrees, mic it again. If the thread is not cut concentric to the OD of the part, you're going to see differences in these readings. This is going to show you that eccentricity or whip that you really can't see with your eye, but you must put the wires on one side of the part. So you're using the root feature of the thread as one locator and the OD of the material as the other locator. And if there is a discrepancy in the concentricity, you're going to see it. That's the only way you're going to see it. All right, let's take a walk out to the machine, take a look at the thread that I got. Hopefully I can get this camera in there and uh, film it without crashing either the camera or the machine. And I'll show you exactly how I would do, you know, chasing a damaged thread in an edge Let's take a walk.
in a heavy damage scenario like this, you can see what I just did to this thread. It's almost a sin to do that. You can see the bulge into the thread profile. As it comes around the bottom, you can see the half moon bulge that has formed from the punch in three locations. Now, although I will not be able to restore the, the crest profile right there, what I'm looking to do is put this back in there, pick it up sufficiently so that I can put the tool back in that groove and clean off that ugly spot. Okay, that's the challenge. I think if we're going to review options on how to repair a damaged thread, let's review all the options. Naturally, if you don't have a die that you can pass down over top of the thread, oh, they sell these things. These are called thread files. And you can see on the reflection there, this is a 28 on this end, 32. You'll have eight different pitches per file. So naturally, if you have a bunch of different threads you want to repair, you have to buy different size thread files. I've never particularly cared for these. These are kind of uh, in an emergency only type use in my shop. But it's nice to have them on hand if there's something that you just can't take the time to set up in single point or whatever. They also come in metric. Now I keep this one in the plastic because if I touch anything metric, I break out in a rash. Only kid. Good thing you know about, okay? Thread files, keep them in mind. Next thing. And certainly one of the easiest solutions is a three-sided file. By default, three sides is a 180-degree triangle, 60 degrees per side. Most imperial threads and a lot of metric threads are 60 degrees. If your damage of your part is on one side of the pitch and not the other, it is a really good idea to take one side of your file and buff the teeth off of it, okay? The smooth side of the file goes down in the V against the clean part of the thread. That way, as you're repairing, you're only removing the damage on the damaged side of the pitch and not on the other side. So clean one side off. If the whole thing is smashed in, then by all means, use a triangular file and do both sides at one time. Naturally, available in a variety of different sizes. Cleaning the burrs off the top of the thread, believe it or not, a round file. As it sits across the pitch on the top, it hits the burr side of the V really nicely. So just don't put too much pressure on it or you're going to end up with an undersized OD. Three different ways to do it. Four if you have the dies available. If you don't, there you go. All right. Another thought. When you have damage to a part, it is very possible that you're going to have a distortion in the thread that is uh, movable, depending on how soft your, your material is. If you have a part that's smushed over in one direction, you can put a punch down in there and try to dislocate or, or relocate some of the material as you see fit. Be gentle, but if it moves too easily, it's probably fractured and should come off. That way you don't have this little remnant artifact jumping around in your assembly that's going to act as a little miniature lock washer at the worst possible moment. So let's put this guy back in the machine and pick it up and I'll show you how it's done. I'll show you how I do it anyway. If you are like the majority of the machines that I've seen, your compound is probably set up like this for your threading operation. Well, when you're going to chase a thread, I would suggest strongly you set it up this way in line with the travel of the machine perpendicular to your part that way when you center your threading tool in the groove when you have to pick it up and you can't move the entire carriage and you only can move the compound well any left right movement of your tool will not affect your depth I'm sure you can visualize it. If you were set back on your 29 and a half degrees, or 28 or whatever you set it at, because I thread with my cross slide, not with my compound, any movement left or right of the tool is going to result in a dive or a withdrawal. So if you want just a couple less things to worry about on your first attempt at doing this, move this around to zero, square this back up to your part, and set it up this way. You're going to be glad you did. It's just one less thing to worry about. Unfortunately, the demonstration that I'm about to give you 
was shot before this segment so my compound is set this way 30 degrees yeah I know it's 30 degrees off the wrong axis but trust me it was 30 degrees for the job I was doing so when I move my tool left or right in the setup you're about to see I do have to correct the cross slide in order to maintain the same depth do it straight it's easier next step in the process is to time the carriage movement to the thread don't worry about where the tool is realistically you don't even need the tool but I'm leaving the tool in so I can have a visual I want to stop my tool somewhere well into at least the halfway point of this thread because of all that slap that I showed you on the board so I'm going to start the machine up wait for the numbers to come around I'm going to engage the half nut and then I'm going to shut everything off power wise do not disengage the half nut Remember, this is strictly to time the carriage movement to the thread, nothing else. Do not worry about the tool position right now. And if this is all happening too fast for you, then slow the RPM of the machine down, and it will give you more time to react between your controls. All right. This is where you use the compound to align the thread tool to the profile of the existing thread. Right here. Okay, the first step in successfully re-indicating a part to make sure it's true. I'm just going to snug it up for now in the chuck. It's not tight. First thing I'm going to do is indicate that small land right there. Now I cheated and I have a square face that I know was turned at the same time as the diameter. This gives me an advantage of knowing that the part is not sitting in here true in one spot and whipping. If the front of the part is true, then although it may be eccentric, it is axial eccentric. So I'm going to indicate the face first and I'm going to tap that until it runs true. I'm even taking the threading tool out just to really add some fun here. The indicator holder is a US General Model 387. It is about 45 years old so if you can find one good luck. Sears also made one for a while and uh, it was pretty identical so if you can find it get it. It's a great little tool. Alright, well, like you heard me say before, if the indicator needle is not moving, and this one is not moving, flex the indicator arm in and out just to make sure that you are not bottomed out on the indicator, and in fact, we have a good reading. So let's go for concentricity now. Next step. Once you've successfully indicated it to zero, make sure all of your adjustment screws are nice and tight. Well, not tight, but you don't want them loose. If it changes anything, do it again. And just to double check myself, I'm moving to the nose journal. I am going to check that one as well. Now it's within a couple of tenths. I'm going to leave it alone. Back into gear, I'm going to do this at 320 RPM. I'm kind of liking that camera angle, that works for me. I can watch a little TV here and everything works well. Okay, I'm going to move the starting point of my tool back to somewhere around the original route. I'm going to set a stop and I am going to remember that this stop, this area where this is bumping up against, is going to have to be adjusted because it's not going to be the same. This tool is going to migrate this way. It's going to change everything. 
I'm going to back the carriage off of the park to make sure that the direction of travel is what I'm looking for. with my tool. You can see the tip of the tool. I am not touching the part. I'm going to engage the half nut, let it run about halfway into this thread so all the slop is taken out of everything, and I'm going to shut the machine down. Alright. Perfect. where a lot of people will light up the top of the part with everything they got trying to see as much as they can. But you're going to shoot yourself in the foot if you do that. Just don't do it. Grab yourself a piece of paper towel, leftover pad, whatever you got. Put it under the part. Give yourself a nice reflective background to the profile that you want. And then get the light off the top of the part and light up underneath the part instead. It's like having a comparator. Love it. Still got a little bit of reflection on the thread, but it gives you a nice edge. Now with a combination of your compound and your cross slide, get the tip of that tool down in that groove as close as you can. And if I could look through the camera, I would. You can see, if you're looking at what I'm looking at, you can see, unfortunately, the camera is really blocking my view here. My view shows me that the right side of this tool is closer than the left. Okay, now I have contact on the left. Back it out a couple, move it back in. on the top of the tool. Check it again. Okay, just for yucks, I am going to snug the compound. Record my number on my cross slide is 46. So when I start my thread, I can start my thread, but not on 46. Stay at least 10 thou away. Depending on the extent of the damage, you don't want the thread coming around and banging on the tool. So use your judgment as far as how much you want to impact that tool on the first try. I'll start off at 20 and go from there. Half nut is released. Three position light so I don't tear it off. I'm going to blow up the threads now. Pull back in the groove. You 
can mess around with the carriage and the cross slide at this point as much as you want and it's not going to change the timing of the carriage when you engage the half nut. I'm going to back out off the part anyway just so I don't eat my words. Number 46 was my number, so I'm going to go to 20 right now. And I would say we're going to see three distinct chips come off of this part. Let's find out. You know, if you do not want to mess up the timing of your thread, do not take the machine out of gear. Okay, we have contact on all three. Yes, we do. You can see the white showing through from the blue. So we are tracking good. Let's go for 30 on the depth. Actually 35. I'm not going to get a little excitable here and go for it. This is where you need to be patient. You know the whole train analogy that I showed you on the board? This is where you have to be patient and realize that things are not as they seem when you initially locate your tool. 35. clearly that the threading tool is definitely engaging the damage. That's a good thing. And all I did to move the chuck was to disengage my electronic brake, so timing is still good. I'm going to go for 40. Contact in the rear, I was shocked to see that. Let's go 42. This is a very superficial cut. The blue on the inside of the thread, I'm going to call that side of the thread the inside. The blue is starting to be removed, but not on the outside. I'm going to back the compound off half a fat. Running at the exact same number, 42. Expecting no chip at all. Dude. Go for 43. Creeping up on the 46, we saw a contact. Love it. 44. see 
some of that blue coming off, so I'm going for 45. Close to finish size. Starting to show traces on either side. I'm going to go to 47 and then check the profile. Double cut at 47. Okay, you can see that the blue is remaining on the impact side. It's clear on either side, which means there's no distortion on the impact side. Back side, we are still having a little bit of blue on either side. I am going to back the compound out now. I'm not doing the cross slide, I'm going to back the compound out. And it doesn't matter what angle the compound's on, we're just looking for anything that's going to give us motion uh, along the axis of the part. I'm going to back it off another now. All I want to do, I want to start seeing the blue on either side of that white cut right there, the virgin aluminum. I want to see the blue on either side start to go away. That way I know the tool is tracking where I want it to track. That's the damage, that's what I'm going to address. This is a one thou shift that way. This is the patience part, guys. There's just no quicker way to do this. If this is a critical thread, you don't want to rush it. I'm just going to go deeper. Going for 50. Some scratching, but nothing positive. Back the compound off another thou this way. Okay, you can still see the blue on either side of the damage, so we're moving the cutting tool this way to address it. one thou at a time.
sure, not yet. Okay, we'll hang on with the narrative and we will just make it happen. We're going to move another foul. Make it two this time. That is a successful repair, guys. I'm going to use my handy dandy Randy Richard in the shop scriber here to point it out. We no longer have any blue on either side of the damage. The existing blue that you do see is the impact, so that is below the profile of the tool. You are not going to get that out. As you can see as it comes around the bottom. area right here. The V is really clean where the damage is. Over here, this side. Still some remnant blue left so the major or the pitch diameter of the part has not drastically changed. You're going to scuff it, you're going to make contact nothing is ever going to go back in exactly the way it came out. We're going to get some alcohol, some biking maneuver, clean this thread up, and we'll get back in a second. Anytime you have damage to a thread, make sure that you don't have a fractured element that is hanging onto the part that is going to jump off down inside of your mating piece and act as a little locking wedge. Inspect it very closely for anything that may be hanging on or trying to break off. Let's see if we get a nice close look at that profile. Let me look up here against the black contrast on the top. You can see that the swelling damage from the impact is gone. You are not going to be able to take care of the top so if the boss comes running out and said that you didn't fix it, tell him, well, you know, put it back together and then come and see me. Yeah, that's how it's done, guys. I wish I could have 12 cameras running at the same time so you could see exactly all the combined compound and cross-slide moves. But uh, try to bear in mind the movements with the compound are going to affect the depth of the thread. So make sure every time you make a movement with the compound, you back the cross-slide out and start a couple thou away from where you were. That is all I got for you, and I hope that's still in focus. It's really hard to tell. It's all shiny. I would say that was a successful repair. Keep in mind that you can, like I said, put a sleeve over top of the part to indicate the thread if you need to, and be patient. That's how it's done. Thanks for watching. All right, guys. Well, the first time that you chase a thread, you're going to be very proud of yourself when you come up with a positive result, but the key to a successful chase job on repairing a thread is to set up naturally make sure the part is running true concentric everything is solid all the machine everything is dialed in you're you know exactly what pitch you're supposed to be set at so the setup is number one patience is number two don't rush it when you get close make sure you blew up your part watch it dust it make the adjustments be patient if you're patient you will be rewarded for your efforts anyway i hope you like what you saw it's fun to do uh, practice Make a part, bang it up, put it back in and fix it before the real deal comes along and you have to sweat because a customer's sitting in the lobby with a cup of coffee going, hey, I got to go. Anyway, thanks for coming back. Appreciate it. Hey, been getting a lot of emails, messages from all over the world, and I am really digging it. Uh, South Africa's checking in. Australia's always checking in. UK's checking in. I'm getting just great feedback. So do me a favor. When you leave your comment, just leave me what country you're from because I really enjoy seeing it. This 
channel reaches 127 countries around the world every month, and I am just flattered by that. So thank you very much. Joel Pye, Vance Invasions, Austin, Texas. I'm out.